Okay, so let's let's go ahead and do that. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is Todd Pantezzi. I am your very loyal, long-serving uh, industry co-chair of the ACT-IAC Health Community of Interest. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, I'll do some introductions here and then turn it over to our speakers. That's why you're here, not to hear me, but to hear our, our, our speakers today. Uh, I'll put in a note for uh, my partner on this. Uh, you all know Bobby Saxon, uh, Deputy CIO for CMS and our government co-chair of this community of interest. He'll be joining us late today, um, but of course he's always behind the scenes working hard. So expect he'll pop in later on once his other duties are, are over with today. So as most of you know, um, and I'll reiterate this for those of us, uh, those of you who are new to this uh, community of interest, uh, we've been working for about two years now as a, as a COI, and we've built a, a very good cadence, I think, in terms of having monthly meetings. I believe that we've been consistent in having a monthly meeting scheduled ever since last October, and of course, we're continuing that here today. Uh, we'll be spending this first hour, uh, and I'll do some introductions here with a, a moderated session and our speakers, uh, but please do hang on once we finish that a little after one o'clock, perhaps. We'll spend a few minutes with a business meeting of our community interest uh, uh, of interest. I'll talk about upcoming uh, events that we have with National Institutes of Health and the Food and Drug Administration. Uh, we'll have a quick update on a project that we're doing with the VA and some other activities. Uh, uh, our, our speakers are welcome to stick around for that as well. Uh, but otherwise, uh, let's launch into our program itself and turn it over to Jimmy Benani, who's been a core member of our COI from the beginning. And Jimmy, thank you so much for setting this up today. And if you just want to please go ahead and introduce our esteemed speakers, and we'll launch right into the presentation. Great. Thanks, Todd. I definitely appreciate it. Um, again, I'd like to welcome everyone, as Todd mentioned, to this month's uh, Health Community Interest Meeting. Um, I see some familiar faces and names, so thanks for joining again. And then see some new ones. So that's also a very exciting for us as a group because we are continuing to um, evolve and, and kind of grow our practice and presence as well. So thank you for the new members that are joining for the first time today. Hopefully uh, we'll get this on our regular cadence calendar as well. Uh, also, uh, thank you for taking time during your lunch hour. I know there's a lot going on and so appreciate you willing to spend your lunch hour with us. Uh, as Todd mentioned, my name is Jimmy Bonani and I'm the industry vice chair for the COI. Uh, while I'm not engaging or working with ACT Act in my my day job, I lead our XLS Federal Health and Civilian Practice, and I'm incredibly excited to help facilitate this conversation with both Renata and Jerry today. I'll let them introduce themselves in a minute, but I've, I have the pleasure of working with them on a, on a regular basis and then thrilled to have them join us today and to learn more about and share all the great things that are happening at HHSOIG, uh, learn a little bit more about their role and how, how they're approaching the problems and solutions and, and uh, the mission that they're they're charged with. And also, um, you know, given its its role and purview, I think the OIG has a unique opportunity and perspective. And I, I really want to highlight that because sometimes I, I do believe that not many people that, that work with that, you realize that. So I think this is going to be a great opportunity for others on the call to also see that they touch a lot of programs across federal health, right? And, and given the focus of this group uh, across federal health, it was very relevant and, and very interesting to say the least. So uh, with that being said, a couple of quick housekeeping things. Uh, I'll facilitate the conversation, facilitate it more like a fireside chat or a panel discussion. So we want this to be informal, engaging as well. So if you have questions, please feel free to unmute your line, ask questions. You can also drop them in the Q&A if you don't feel you want to interrupt or you want to just have it in there. I'll try to monitor that and, and, and uh, facilitate those questions as appropriate. We'll also leave a little bit of time at the end for a formal Q&A as well. And then last but not least, we are recording this session. So thank you for uh, Jer Jerry and Renata to volunteer for that. So just want to make sure the rest of the participants are aware that this is being recorded just for um, as a disclaimer. So with that being said, let's go ahead and get started. Um, I want to just kick this off a little bit with just maybe in introduction. So uh, Renata, if you want to go first, just in your introductions, your current role responsibilities, and maybe a high level overview of just your professional career and, and your current role at o OIG and the path you took to get here. It would be great. And then we can take it, uh, turn it over to Jerry as well. Thank you, Jimmy. And thank you all. Um, it's so wonderful to hear that um, industry is coming together on, um, you know, healthcare issues. And uh, I've, I've perused the act website in this area, and it sounds like you guys are tackling some really important and relevant um, areas. So thank you. And I appreciate the opportunity. So a little bit about me. Um, I am currently the chief data and analytics officer 
at the Department of Health and Human Services Office of the Inspector General. I am beyond honored to serve in this role. Um, the team here is outstanding. Um, they're innovative, they're mission oriented, and really creative. They have a sense of a tenacity about them to really kind of crack the nut on some really hard um, and challenging problems with limited resources. So um, what, what's my role here and why is it important? Um, our mission um, within the Chief Data Office is to empower OIG to use data proactively by putting data at the fingertips of our auditors, investigators, evaluators, and attorneys. And so what that really means is um, helping our organization to um, make sense of <laughs> the vast portfolio that we have and help target our resources most effectively. Uh, so right now, HHS, um, the spending is close to $2 trillion. Um, That's because of COVID. <laughs> so it's a massive amount of funding. Um, we cover enormous programs that touch nearly every um, American's lives. Um, so it's Medicare, Medicaid, um, CDC, NIH, FDA. Um, so we have our hands in a lot of issues and we really serve as like the last line of protection for our most vulnerable um, citizens. So um, children in foster care, children at the border, um, people in nursing homes, the, the poor. So it is really important that we um, target our efforts effectively. And so just to kind of contrast, you know, how small we are and compared to our mission. Um, so HHS OIG is about 1600 people. Um, that's compared to uh, about 80,000, I think, at HHS right now, um, not including contractors. Uh, our budget is about 400 million compared to the 2 trillion that I just mentioned. And, um, and so it's really important for us to target our efforts. And the best way to do that is to um, use data and analytics. So we are heavy, heavy users of CMS data, uh, both Medicare and Medicaid. We look through claims, um, we identify, you know, anomalies, um, trends, patterns that are um, suspicious. And we work with our um, auditors, attorneys, agents, and investigators to to um, kind of target where, where we're seeing waste, fraud, and abuse. Um, how I got here, uh, so I, I've always been drawn to really hard challenges. <laughs> and um, I have to say, full disclaimer, I never thought I would find myself at an IG's office. I'm a very hands-on, action-oriented person. I like implementing things. And uh, what drew me to HHS OIG was really um, the ability to touch this vast amount of data. <laughs> and um, I think from an oversight perspective, there's so much more of a direct impact um, because we are really, you know, we have a um, investigative function where we have a, you know, a law enforcement function where we can prosecute, um, you know, bad actors. And um, I think it, I think it's a little bit more than just program audits. It's, it's, you know, really protecting um, beneficiaries more directly. So I got here um, through a kind of a weaving way, but um, it's been, I think I would, I would summarize it by constantly being attracted to uh, challenges. And I think at the crux of many challenges is, is data. And so um, previously I was at the U.S. Department of Treasury um, in many different roles, um, but my most recent role at Treasury was um, essentially the um, predecessor for what now is called the, the Chief Data Officer at the Bureau of the Fiscal Service. Um, and I led the government-wide implementation of the Digital Accountability and Transparency Act. And, um, and then after that, I went over to the private sector for a short time, um, really just curious to understand the workings um, from the outside <laughs> and to drive impact that way. And then um, was found a really amazing opportunity here at HHS OIG. So anyway, I will stop talking and I'll hand it over to back over to you, Jimmy. Yeah, no, thank you. That, that was that was phenomenal. Thanks for now. That, that touches on a lot of things that I think was very important for us to, to hear. And then I think the audience to learn about OIG, especially if you don't interact with the IG on a daily basis. So I'll turn it over to Jerry. Do you want to do a similar introduction and just kind of give us a little bit about your background and kind of where, where you've been before as well? Sure. Um, 
thanks for having me. Um, honored to be here. My name is Gerald Karen. I go by Jerry, which is fine as well. I am the Chief Information Officer for the Department of Health and Human Services Office of the Inspector General. Uh, I've been here officially since May is when I actually took the job, May 9th, um, but I have been on here on detail since uh, mid-December or so. Uh, previously, before I came here, I was uh, at the Department of State. I started at the Department of State after getting out of the Army in 2001, where I was actually a person answering telephones as a contractor on the help desk, and then worked my way up through the organization and within the same bureau uh, to become a senior executive. Uh, my last position was director of enterprise network management, which was the uh, basically the infrastructure person for the department. I did all the networking, active directory, all the enterprise level things that we provided to the department. Um, challenging job, 275 sites overseas, 109,000 users, a little bigger than what I'm experiencing now. Uh, Renata said we have about 1,600 users, not counting the contractors. Uh, but, you know, IT's got the same challenges no matter where you are. Um, but I'm really honored to be here. Uh, it, it's a great job. Uh, Renata talked about what a lot about what the OIG, so I'm not going to repeat all that. But what I've noticed, you know, coming from a larger organization and coming to this organization, there's the one thing I'd point out that there's so much of a close knit relationship with the mission uh, throughout the organization. And, and, and all the people within the organization are really a lot closer. Um, so it's really clear what you're supporting. Um, for As a chief information officer, of course, I'm responsible for all aspects of IT. Um, and doing that, definitely, you know, there's a lot to assess. There's a lot, you know, from security to the business aspects to enabling the mission, um, the data. Uh, architecture as well is very important. Uh, Renata and I are peers. Um, although we both work heavily in IT, we are peers. Uh, I see Renata as a great peer partner and uh, as well as she's a customer of mine because she uses some technologies that uh, we're responsible for managing that she takes advantage of. Um, in that sense, definitely enabling the mission is, is the key point, but doing so in a secure way. Um, and you know, with Renata's responsibilities and data, my responsibilities for maintaining security as well. And with the executive order on zero trust, of course, that's a, that's been a big soapbox item of mine for the last few years. Um, I have an architecture drawn out. So I'm presenting that architecture, presented to all of Renata's staff. Um, this is, you know, the, what we're striving to do because data is the gold that, that we're, that we're making informed decisions now and we're aggregating that data and the data lakes and data warehouses, but we got to make sure the right data to the right people at the right time. Um, so definitely there's a security aspect It's different than what we've done with the compliance aspects of FISMA before where, all right, yeah, I provided username and password. So check I've done authentication, but that's not very effective. We all know that. Um, so introducing new architectures, new ideas, modernized ideas, um, that I've been introducing here as well. So great. thank you, Jared. Appreciate that. That was, yeah. um, you touched on a couple of great things that I do want to uh, touch on later on about the, the relationship and kind of the working, how you and Renata as the CIO and the CDO work together and how does that really come to, to fruition? Because I think there's a lot of great conversation happening and it's fairly new, as we know, the CDO role within the federal government and every agency is kind of tackling a little differently. And I think our audience will definitely um, get a lot of value of just understanding a, a uh, one example of how that could work in the, in the government effectively. So we'll, we'll definitely come back to that a little bit, but I did have uh, a question for you, given that both of you are relatively new, you said, you know, about six to seven months, Jerry and Renata, maybe a little over a year. You said, what are some, what's, what are really attracted you to OIG? I mean, obviously there's a lot of agencies out there and the, the data and the technology in terms of the, the focus of yours, but are there certain things about OIG that really stood out for you in terms of the, the mission or, or the agency itself that was really appealing? I can I can take that on first. Um, I mentioned, yeah, I was at Treasury before, and um, this was um, around the time when the Evidence Act Evidence Act was just passing, uh, and so this concept of a CDO had already existed, but it wasn't like really formalized. And um, the organization that I was a part of, Bureau of the Fiscal Service, um, you know, 
dealt with a lot of data, um, a lot of transactional data. So doing all the government's payments, collections, government-wide accounting, debt collection. Um, but it was viewed in a very transactional way in terms of what's the least amount of data we need to you know, achieve the, 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 the goal. Um, and it wasn't really thought of as like, hey, how do we analyze this data to improve our operations? I think it was a goal um, at the time that I was there, but it wasn't really fully um, implemented. You know, it was, it was really hard to kind of change cultures, change structures. Um, what attracted me to HHS OIG is actually my predecessor, uh, Carol Brzmakowicz, who I consider an incredible leader. And uh, she um, was started the chief data office at HHS OIG about six years ago. So we're actually one of the first within the IG community, I would probably say um, within the executive branch. And it was interesting to learn how she had uh, already worked through some of the challenges that I was seeing and um, had rallied support for leadership and the organization to establish a centralized data analytics function and had already kind of worked through some of the issues that I was seeing um, were going to come <laughs> you know, later on at Treasury. Right. So it was really exciting for me to join an organization that was um, beyond the initial point. It was sort of up at the top. And I was excited to learn and um, and be a part of that. So that's what drew me. And of course, a mission, hung mission, you know, impact hungry. So just hearing about the access to the data and the impact that we could have, I was I was really excited about it. Great. Thanks. Thank you very much. Jerry, what about you? Anything else to add to that in terms of other things that from your perspective or based on your background, you thought HHS OIG had a kind of different lens to look at it from? I love the clarity of the mission, the very transparent mission that it has um, and being close to that mission and, and helping each component and enabling that mission. Uh, that would, meant a lot to me. And also, the and, and Renata said it, the impact that I could bring. Uh, my supervisor definitely, you know, throwing some of the ideas out there that I've had for years you know, it's like this, I'd like to do this. I'd like to do this and, and being very supportive. And it's like, well, if you want to do that, go, go get it. Um, whereas, <laughs> and don't get me wrong. I'm not, I'm not saying anything negative about my previous uh, job, but sure, sure. it was a big organization and there's a lot of pieces to pull together to get something done um, yeah. because of the way it was organized and how big it was and, and all the different disparate bureaus had their own IT and you had to be an enterprise person. You know, anything I touched, I had to make sure that, you know, everybody knew or it didn't affect anybody else. So it was very, very sensitive position. Um, you know, you, you, everybody knows your name when something goes wrong. <laughs> right. So kind of thing. But it, it was it was challenging in that way. But I mean, you know, thank God for that, for my previous positions at, at state, you know, that got me to where I am today. And, and it just came to a time. It's like, you know, uh, looking outward, um, being at state for 20 years, looking outward, what other opportunities are there? Um, not necessarily that the grass is always greener, but, you know, just, just keeping options open. And I uh, happened to come across this, this position and, um, you know, talking with some of the people here, um, you know, my predecessor, uh, my, my current supervisor, it's just like the, this, this, the grass is probably greener. It sounds like, uh, and, and yeah, uh, you know, there is green grass over here and I'm, and I'm loving it. Um, you know, the, the, there's a family atmosphere, I think within throughout the whole OIG that I really appreciate, um, that that's, there's a real, real, real good thing about that i mean even our acting ig every friday or every other friday she has a chat you know and and it's telling us everything that's going on in other parts of the ig which i just think is great you know um so you get a little you know more connected uh to what's going on in the, and it's very transparent and you, you feel a good sense of yeah i am contributing to something and i know what that is yeah that that's uh that's an overwhelming uh common theme i i I hear when I talk to, to both of you, but your teams and other folks at OIG is, is that, that the connectedness to the mission, right? You can see, and I think that really drives people to be engaged and motivated and really it makes a difference the, what they're, the work they're doing, which is as, as professionals, we all know, incredibly valuable and just really fulfilling as when you know you're making an impact. And so that, that's great. And, and so with that mission, I think there's probably one of the questions I've, I've heard or I've, I, I, I wanted to ask is, it is a little bit of a unique mission OIG has compared to other op optives within HHS, right? I think there's 
it's very broad, but also just kind of the oversight function generally as the mission. So are there some maybe benefits to that mission that you, you think that OIG provides? And then also on the flip side, some challenges um, given the mission OIG that you're, you've as individuals in your roles face, but also just collectively as an agency. I'm, I'm curious, because I think it'll be helpful for, to hear that perspective. So maybe this time, I'll, Jerry, I'll start with you if you have any thoughts. Yeah, I, you know, definitely there's the the common things that you expect from an OIG doing the audits and things. But, you know, we, we do have gun toting investigators, you know, that do Medicaid, Medicare fraud, opioid abuse, and, and um, as well as organized crime. We have a lot of lawyers that do litigation around these same things as well. Um, it is the largest IG in the executive branch. And the, the challenges is, there's a very important mission there and um, we're small staff um, because we're a small organization. Um, so, you know, being able to have to prioritize to be able to uh, help and enable um, understand what the, the various missions are and uh, what technologies they need in order to accomplish them uh, definitely is something that is communication is very important. Uh, with each of the components that I have to support in understanding their mission. So that's, uh, you know, we just had, and Renato was part of it because um, because we're, we're both fairly new and, and at least in our roles, Renato's been with the OIG for a while, but we just had one component and they brought every branch chief in and just explained what every branch does. And it's just like, you get so much of an appreciation and getting down to those details. And it's like, you know, and you start thinking, all right, they're doing this. How can I better support that? Um, so there's the challenges, but being small is that's the challenging part, I think, is being small with, a, you know, limited staff, you know, got to prioritize and know what um, the best bang for the buck is and, and manage expectations. So part of that big part of that is communications, which I'm always an advocate for is good communications and transparency, I think, uh, goes a long way. Perfect. Right. Renata, did you want to add? Yeah, I'd echo what Jerry said, but um, add to that. So it's great kind of being small, but also seeing across. So HHS is huge, right? Optives, staff divs, yeah. Medicare, Medicaid, and we get to see it all. We're at that center of that. And um, we have purview over all of those programs. So I think it's, it's really a unique place to be. Um, and then from a data perspective, we have access to that data. You know, it may take some time, but we have access to that data. So that's pretty amazing. And we're able to connect dots across um, programs and, and issue areas where maybe, um, you know, an optive or staff div is sort of more siloed in their um, responsibility. And then I think, you know, just Jerry on the IT perspective. So we are, we value our independence greatly at HHS OIG. And, you know, we have our own network here. Um, we have, and we have, the, because we're small, it's actually also a benefit. We're able to roll things out um, a little bit more nimbly and, um, and kind of test things out and tinker. And we've also, we've been seen as a kind of a place for innovation within HHS because we're able to you know, roll it out and then share that. And then the department says, okay, great. You know, this worked here. We can push that out. So those are the only two things I'd add. Yeah. That's, that's a very interesting point that I think is really valuable is that you, um, because of the size and the reach, uh, you are able to kind of be kind of like in a, innovative in a way that trying out things and failing or, or quickly and being able to then also be yeah. successful and rolling out stuff that is probably impacting all of HHS. And I think that's a very unique position for an organization so small in the whole uh, in the landscape of things, right? One one other tidbit that I think is interesting that I, I heard, I think maybe Carol back in the day mentioned is, think about it from an organization where OIG is a, a, a law enforcement arm. There's also a, a law firm, right? Because you have lawyers, you have auditors, and you have policy amongst all of that. So all of that functions that you think all into uh, into one different organization and having different kind of reaches across HHS. So that's a, a very simplified way of thinking of just the the types of things that the folks at OIG touch, right, in terms of the, the programs, but also the, the verticals. So I think it's incredibly exciting and also a lot to handle. <laughs> and to your point, Jerry, I think I can see that the challenge of it being, you know, not having enough staff and resources to kind of touch all that. So We've talked a lot about maybe big picture strategy, high level culture and mission. I think this is great. Maybe we take a little bit of a, a, a dive into more of the details. I think a lot of folks on the call would be also interested in. Um, are there, can you maybe talk a little bit about specifically about um, highest high impact or valuable programs or things that you're dealing with right now? 
uh, or, or undertaking as part of your organization that um, you'd want the larger kind of population to be aware of or just want to find interesting to share with this group? And uh, Renan, I'll go with you first this time. Sure. Uh, so Jimmy, you know this project pretty well, <laughs> um, but our grants analytics portal is something I definitely want to highlight, um, both because of its um, I think proven success and the way that we've been successful on applying advanced analytics and um, artificial intelligence um, in, in our work. So um, the Grants Analytics Portal essentially gives our uh, OIG components a bird's eye view and a way to I identify risk um, across the broad and vast HHS grant portfolio. Um, we bring in data from um, many different sources. Some of it is open data, um, like that we convert into um, machine readable data. Um, so uh, it's something wonky thing called single audit data that we essentially convert text into um, data that a machine can read and then score um, and analyze. Uh, we bring in uh, payments data, so data from, from within the department um, and, and the whole, and, and data from external um, government agencies like GSA. And it, what it does is really provides auditors, evaluators, and investigators a way to um, target and un understand risk um, across the broad portfolio. Um, and I mentioned we've been really successful in applying um, advanced analytic uh, methods. And so we've got this really cool um, recurrent neural network um, that enables us to identify risk. We've, we've been successful in doing some topic modeling, um, really bringing out um, areas that don't necessarily service themselves in you know, the, the text I mentioned um, with a single audit data. And um, you know, NIH is obviously a huge grant making agency and we've recently um, done this really cool analysis um, using graph database to uh, show relationships between um, principal investigators who are the kind of um, belly button to the grants that NIH um, gives out. So um, that's been work that's been very interesting and I think very fruitful. One other one um, that I really wanna highlight that speaks to one of my personal passions is um, making government data more accessible and available to the public. And so we recently launched our GeoHub and our first GeoHub product. Uh, so we're leveraging um, our geospatial capability to um, really highlight the, um, the information and the, um, the seriousness of the um, substance use uh, epidemic, I'd say. So I think uh, here's a quote I have here. So um, according to recent data reported by the CDC, over 81,000 drug overdoses um, occurred in the United States in the 12 months ending May, 2020 the highest number of overdose deaths ever recorded in a 12 month period. And um, what we did is we launched a public visualization that ties together um, behavioral health medication assistant treatment. Um, it enables people to view overdose death rates across the country by county and kind of zoom in, um, identify high need counties uh, where there's low or no capability to provide, you know, Morphine services, um, drive time analysis to you know, SAMHSA certified behavioral health facilities, uh, and it really and it ties into our um, evaluations and audit work. So it's just really nice way to visualize the issue and also the reports and recommendations that HGS OIG has um, presented. So two highlights for me. Wow, yeah, that, talk about impact, right? I mean, that that's incredible just to even hear about it. I know some of it, but some of this is also just new to me. And, and it touches to your point, not just internally OIG, but individuals that are really experiencing those uh, things right now. And so that's that's great. Um, I'll have, I have a follow-up, but I'll, I'll come back to that. But Jerry, how about on your end, do you want to talk a little bit about um, specific initiatives or projects that you're uh, extremely man, excited about? Man, mine's going to be so boring after hearing all that cool stuff. <laughs> I think Renata's group does some great things that that just you know every time I see some of their output it's just awesome um but you know to being able to enable them to be able to do that is that's right is, is that's a welcome right. thing right um uh, but some of the things that I'm looking at doing um being here you know um you know just a short time however uh security is a big aspect of what I've been involved in um 
I've had a zero trust architecture for many years, um, which we're working to implement that here, uh, especially with the EO, kind of got a head start, thankfully. Um, I do co-chair the uh, CIO's Innovation Council on Zero Trust, as well as another nonprofit I co-chair, uh, Zero Trust. I know IACT IACT has one. Uh, I know some folks that are on that um, working group as well. Um, that some of them participate in the CIO's Innovation Council. But that is protecting the data at the end of the day. Um, and, you know, I'm not going to go over the whole architecture, but the, the, the main emphasis of Zero Trust is being effective at protecting data, understanding what that data is, what the categorization of that data is. Um, and at the end of the day, making sure that it's not maliciously infiltrated, or it still has its integrity and things like that. Uh, so that's one of the things I'm introducing. Uh, other things is, you know, we have this concept of, you know, trust in our network, the castle and moat kind of thing. Whereas right now, you know, on my laptop, I'm VPNing back to my on-premises network just to go back out to the Zoom cloud here or the internet or whatever other cloud. And I'd like to do untethering, I, you know, to bring some performance enhancements to the users and go straight to their destination. But I still got to get that uh, security telemetry. Um, if you're familiar with um, the Department of Homeland Security's uh, Trusted Internet Connection Program, um, they have TIC 3.0, which allows some flexibilities, um, is less restrictive than the previous versions. Um, so there's some advantages to that, that, that make that the art of the possible now. Uh, one of the other art of the possible things I'm looking at is doing bring your own device, uh, being able to use your iPad, your your personal telephone to at minimally get your mail calendar files, uh, but not being able to download or print it, um, still being secure. Um, but, you know, rather than carrying around two devices, is it possible? And, you know, is there a use case for some people, at least a percentage of the staff that could benefit from that rather than having two devices and of course saving us cost on doing other you know purchasing other and managing and sustaining other devices um there there's many other things that are looking at by um you know the life cycle of hardware the life cycle of the os systems um trying to you know take the desktops images and and refining that in a way so you know a lot of <laughs> probably uh, some of you experience many uh, on your desktop within your office, when you are in your office, uh, many security agents and um, that, that just drag the system down. So I, I've been working on that for many years as well, uh, looking at the same thing here. But definitely things to help the performance for the users um, to give them reliable uh, network tools and things that they can use. Um, one of the other things they're looking at is time to value. Um, you know, it's great to roll out the latest and greatest things, but if it doesn't meet a mission need or people don't know how to use it, there's no value to it. Uh, so how can we get better time to value and educate folks on the existing things that we have? Um, we're probably using like uh, for for us, at least, uh, you know, not promoting any products or anything. We, we, we are we're heavily in O365. Uh, but are we using it to its fullest extent or the users understand how to use it to its fullest extent? Probably not. We're probably using 20, 25 percent of, of its capabilities. And how can we get better value out of that? So looking at the current investments and how to bring better value from those investments and use them in a different ways as well. Got it. That's that's a big undertaking for, for sure. And, and all, all the things you one one follow up question I had, I think that's been a topic of conversation amongst industry and, and the government is uh, at OIG specifically. Um, what is the kind of uh, balance between custom development of software versus using low code platforms or things <laughs> like that, right? I know there's there's a lot of uh, benefits to each. So I'm just curious, kind of what your perspective is and 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 outlook on that. So we know labor is probably the most expensive portion of our budgets uh, when people, right? Yeah. Um, so usually when, and, and this is, this is an opinionated, but you know, I'm going to do what's right at the end of the day, based off the requirements um, and, and market research. Is there anything out there that can do it? Um, but first and foremost, I'd rather be, I'd rather do configuration rather than do customization. Um, because usually I find when you do customization, you need uh, experienced, staff and some in, in whatever that your customizing platform that you're using to customize and you got to be able to sustain it as well whereas something off the shelf that you can configure um 
you know, if it meets the requirements is, is probably more sustainable. However, there's also the con to something off the shelf that you got to kind of maybe manipulate your procedures and processes to fit that tool right. vice where if you do customization, you can do exactly what you want. But like I said, you know, you need the, you, you also need the labor and the sustainability to be able to do it. So usually uh, first and foremost, I'm more of a, you know, low code configure before customization. But and there's some instances that I found in my previous jobs that customization is is the best way sometimes. So it depends right. on, on what the requirements are. No, thanks. Appreciate that. I, I know that's always a question that we get when we have conversations about with different agencies and, and yeah, there's like, pros and cons to each. Um, yep, absolutely. Um, so let's let's pivot a little bit again. Um, and just a reminder for the participants, uh, please definitely uh, engage and interact if you have questions. Um, you can also drop them in the chat. I'm happy to, I'll, I'll bring them up to the panelists as well. Um, but we wanted this to be a two-way conversation. So if there are things that you are interested in, please, uh, Jerry and Renata are definitely in, interested and excited to answer those as well. Um, one of the things that I'm personally really would like to talk about just for everyone's kind of awareness is we mentioned this, the, the CDO role and the CIO role. And I guess uh, knowing that it's relatively, relatively new, you know, the last five or six years in terms of the CDO role, um, and every agency is a little bit different in terms of not just organizationally how these two roles sit, but also um, what the responsibilities are. Uh, can you talk a little bit about how you, as in your roles, work together today to collaborate, drive innovation, and, and what you would recommend to other agencies and uh, other people that are trying to figure this out and what, what you know what's working or what even suggestions you may have to improve that? So uh, it's pretty open-ended. And I'll, Jerry, I'll start with you maybe and then go over to Renata. Okay, it's definitely, and I think Renato would agree, it, there's a necessary partnership that we have to have. Like I said, she's my peer. Um, we, we sit at the same level. We, we don't work for one another. Um, we're, we're peers, we're partners, and as well, I see her as my customer because I'm providing her services. Uh, I also see where I'm going to be her customer for some of the things I want to do, and I need her services and expertise on her team um, to do some of the things that I want to do that are unique, that need, that are very data heavy um, or AI, machine learning heavy, where she's going to have probably expertise that I'm not going to have in my shop or why duplicate effort? Um, because she can probably take advantage of some of the things I wanted to as well. But I think it's really important to have a close partnership with the CDO office, um, for, for the, you know, on all those three reasons, right. Um, of, of what our relationship is peer partner and, and customer, it, you know, we're both very heavily in the it information is what, makes the world go round nowadays. It is the gold. Um, it is the crown jewels that everybody is, you know, making informed decisions off. So, you know, ensuring the integrity of that data, helping ensure the integrity of that data by uh, um, implementing a good security architecture, uh, understanding the data that, you know, being the CIO is responsible for all IT aspects. So, you know, is, is, I still got to make sure is the data secure is, you know, the thing, the tools that they're using are those making sure that the data is secure, there's no breaches, things like that. Um, you know, so there's definitely a very close partnership. Uh, Renata and I have a frequent meeting, one-on-one -on -one meeting just to understand what are her priorities? What are our, my priorities? Uh, we have our teams meet where we go through um, Renata's priorities from her staff. Um, and, you know, we give feedback on um, what we can do, what the, what the expectations are, um, how we can, you know, provide service to them, what the timeframes may be. Uh, but understanding each other's priorities are, is extremely helpful in, in our planning, um, because if I do it in a stove, if I do it in a stovepipe, uh, you know, something's going to come across, you, you know, whether it be from the CBO's office or not, something's going to come across the fence and I'm going to have to be trying to figure out how to juggle it. So, um, and, and vice versa, you know, there's some things that I'm going to be doing like on, uh, one of the IAS or PaaS platforms that's going to affect, you know, Granada's group who's doing work within that environment. So it is very, you know, I think we're both very transparent. We're both very, um, we understand the, the roles and the needs for, for having a close relationship in, in what we're doing. And for us, I, th I think it's just, you know, being the personality wise, I, it's just, we, we, I think, I think we click very well. We, we get along very well, which is just a plus. Um, 
and, and we, we feel comfortable having that open and honest, uh, transparent conversation. And we actually find ways to help each other um, in certain situations, whether it be personnel wise or, or, or things like that, because we both have unique expertises that uh, within our shops that we could take advantage of. So it's been a great relationship, I think, um, the way we've established it uh, since we both started in these positions. Great. That's, that's, that's helpful. That's great insights. Renata, did you want to add anything else to that? Yeah. I, I mean, first and foremost, I really enjoy working with Jeremy. I think we have a great team, a great collaborative, collaborative partnership. Um, we, I would say, I think he sort of imitated this. He didn't quite say it, but my team is a pretty high maintenance customer. <laughs> Um, and that's probably true across government, you know, data scientists, data analysts, like they're so passionate about what they want to do and they want to get their Python packages installed and they want to get their data out. They want to get the latest technology, but it has to, um, be, you know, vetted, right? We need to make sure that the technology is secure, that the data is going to be secured and that we go through the appropriate checks. So I think we, we do, we have a really productive tension there, um, which, you know, especially as we work to um, take full advantage of our cloud resources and capabilities, you know, testing out new things um, and we're learning together. Um, I'd say, you know, some of our data scientists, data analysts have a great understanding of our cloud environment or some of the capabilities um, and we'll share information and vice versa. So I think we, we learn together. Um, I wanna mention that there's kind of two other areas um, that we are really um, joined at the hip on. Uh, one is change management. I know that word is like way overused, but with any sort of new IT or data initiative, it requires change. And um, Jerry and I are at the brunt of it. So we hear the complaints. <laughs> Um, and, and, um, and, but we're also kind of forcing that change, uh, on the organization. And I, and I think it's adding a lot of value, um, and, and then governance. So it's something that people sort of dread, um, uh, but it's so necessary, you know, great. You want all of the technology, you want all of the data. Great. We can't deliver all of it. So how do we, um, establish a structure where we prioritize, and how do we establish a structure where we have the appropriate checks and balances so that um, you know things are architected in the right way and and um, and are secure? So that's all I have to add. You you are uh, I feel like you read my mind. I was going to bring up change manager right after this because uh, but, but I, I've I've heard both of you talk about that and just even the mission and and the diverse set of customers and stakeholders you have. Right? It's it's great that you have a lot of functions, but that also means you have a, a lot of diverse stakeholders and customers to appease, right? And so are, are there any specific examples or, or strategies or ideas around change management that you, that you think are working effectively or things that you can point to um, that just from an example perspective that our, our listeners or our audience might be interested in, like what you've done or your teams have instituted to kind of get that buy-in and, 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 and adoption for some of the things you're trying to roll out? Uh people and communication. I mean, <laughs> it's like nothing revolutionary, but uh, it's amazing how much you have to communicate at every single level to really get people to understand what's happening and how does it impact them and how it will benefit them. Um, and I think, I think we do that pretty well. You know, we have various lead, um, governance sessions and meetings set up where we, we try to structure that in a pretty kind of systematic way. Um, but I'd say the people thing is really important. Um, I, you know, I think what makes us successful as a data and analytics organization is partnering data scientists, data engineers with people who understand the subject matter and the data. And I think that's similar kind of key for change management. You, you understand the business user and their problems and you're able to um, show them the art of the possible, show them some, a new approach and then they kind of see the light and they buy in versus you saying, Hey, we're rolling this thing out. You're going to change. <laughs> you know. Right. So, um, yeah. Great. But yeah, that's, that's I, very helpful. I think, it, it. yeah, I think in my previous life, you know, we actually, in, in my last, you know, um, jobs, we, we, at one time we experienced a lot of outages and we found out that those outages were attributable to a person. Um, doing something, you know, either unscripted, uh, lack of an SOP. 
and no change management process, no reviews, no peer reviews. What testing did you do? Do you have a rollback plan in case things go bad? You know, so we implemented that at the enterprise level and lo and behold, outages went down significantly as a result. So bringing that transparency, those checks, you know, those peer reviews, um, bringing it to a level where everybody realizes and understands, you know, what's being done. Um, so like if I did it within my own stovepipe even, and Renata is not aware that I'm doing change X on this night, you know, where she's running a large batch job, um, possibly, or, or bringing in a lot of data or doing something, some right. kind of backup or something, I might break that, you know, so. I got to bring that transparency about. So that's where change management and, you know, is that governance, that communication, that transparency, that peer checking, that understanding um, and, and having, you know, a formal way in which to review these things to make sure that all the checks and balances are there. Uh, did you test? Do you know, you know, because most outages, like I said, I experienced come down to a user doing something. Um, usually it's not the technology, it's the user fat fingering something, you know, um, a new policy on the firewall, for example. And then all of a sudden, you know, nobody can get to Facebook, <laughs> you know, kind of thing or Facebook video. I can't get to it. Um, you know, you get those calls all of a sudden where something's blocked that you right. know, that wasn't supposed to happen. Um, and then you're, you know, without change management, you go investigate and, you know, you bring, you got to bring all of these resources together. Cause the first thing is when there is a issue or something in it is the first thing is, all right, what changed? What, what's new? Did we have a change or anything? So being able to go back and have that documented review. Oh, here it is. You know, um, if it's not documented review, then you're looking like through for a needle in a haystack sometimes with some of these issues. So, right, right, right. I did, I did see a question come, so I'll maybe direct this to Jerry. You mm -hmm. mentioned the cybersecurity piece and the executive order. Um, there's a question about uh, do you anticipate any sort of increase in, in budget given the fact that the executive order now to spend on zero trust and, and things like that? Or, or, I, pray. I, I pray for it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, there. So there is some ways that um, you know the federal government, you know, did approve some money. Some of it's going to CISA, which is um, a component within the Department of Homeland. Uh, Department of Homeland Security, um, OMB, uh, they, GSA does have what they call a TMF, and I forgot what the TMF stands for at the moment, but they had a TMF fund, which is basically a loan. You have to pay it back, but mm -hmm. they made some accountances because not everybody has the budget to pay back. Um, kind of nervous about that, but there are ways that they're trying to make um, you know, funding available. Um, but one of the things is, is like with the TMF, for example, is, okay, I got that upfront funding. I may have to pay it back, but I also got to pay for sustaining my new thing that I just did or zero trust is a journey. It's, it's not going to be a one year fiscal year thing where I'm going to take a tool, turn it on. and I get zero trust. It's an architecture. It's a framework. There's a lot of pieces to bring together and integrate. So it's a multi-year journey. Um, that, that's what we always call it. We call it a journey. Um, it's not something you do overnight. There's no silver bullet for it. So like if I get money to do that one thing, I'm going to need money to do the next piece or my next gap. Um, but what I am doing is I'm looking at my investments that I already have and how I can take advantage of them most, um, towards my zero trust architecture. I got it compartmentalized in different areas and functions so that I can know where, all right, this gap is filled, this gap is filled and know where my gaps are filled. So I can specifically go after and get that money. Uh, one of the things is, is, you know, keep it simple um, when you put together your zero trust architecture, because you got to be able to maintain and sustain it. Um, I have a lot of automation concepts within mind, uh, taking use of AI, ML. That's where I said, uh, I think Renata's um, group is going to be able to help me is I have the concept of a dynamic risk score. So here are my risk risk methodologies and tolerances. And here's if it reaches above this tolerance level, there's a trigger. Um, you know, and there's taking all this data, unstructured data in it's because it's got to be real time as much as possible to be able to enact a, a proper trigger. So bringing all that data in and making quick decisions about it through MI and ML, uh, ML helping me baseline what normal looks like as well. Mm -hmm. Um, so I know when something is not normal, um, uh, and be able to trigger, but the budget, I, I expect that, um, I'm hoping that there'll be some more discussions about, uh, increases in budget. Um, request. 
you know, the, for some, the, the TMF might be good to get the loan, but there is a payback for a small agency like mine. I don't know if I'm going to have, you know, that money at the end of the day if I borrow it because I got to sustain things as well. Mm -hmm. um, so um, that, that's a challenge. Uh, but there was a lot of money. Um, I don't think it's I don't know how it's going to trickle down. Um, you know, some of it, like I said, went to SISA, some of it with OMB. Mm -hmm. um, still waiting to hear how that's going to trickle down. But, you know, we're making our requests. We're putting in our request. Um, zero trust. You know, here's what we're going to do. Here's our plan. Uh, the EO, our, we have to have our plan within 60 days. It was released last month. So we're a little over the halfway period. Um, so every agency is supposed to put in what is their zero trust plan, their cloud modernization plan, their MFA plan, uh, multi-factor authentication plan, as well as encryption, I think, are the four big things that we're supposed to put plans in at the 60-day mark. So I, I'm still waiting to hear more about what other budget um, possibilities there are, but I'm hoping there are more than just the TMF available. Got it. Thank you. That, that's helpful. Yeah. And I think TMS is a thing that's the technology modernization fund. I think. Yeah. Was, yeah. That's, that's it. Yep. But of course, off the top of my head, no, no, it's add a, a brain. A, a, a brain. Acronyms, right. Exactly. Um, yeah. brain, that, that was the, this, the, the four things you just mentioned are great kind of segue into maybe um, one of the questions I think our, our um, participants usually like to understand is what, what's on your roadmap in the future, right? Are there things that you're looking at? So I know we've talked about them here and there um, through the conversation today, but Zero Trust and AI and machine learning talked about that. Are there um, specific either technologies or tools or approaches that you're looking at implementing? Uh, you know, we use the term emerging um, technologies as a generic term, but are there things along those uh, lines that as an agency you're starting to kind of dip your toe in and are interested in learning more about? If so, um, I'd love, we'd love to hear about that a little bit too. Maybe Renata, if you want to go on this one yeah. first. Sure. Um, so yeah, big focus on artificial intelligence, and um, we're we're kind of taking the bite first at exploring um, robotic process automation opportunities to automate, um, you know, processes to save time. You know, and that, that the benefit of that is there's a good uh, return on investment, and so you can articulate that value, and hopefully you get more funding <laughs> afterwards. Right, right. We also have some moonshot projects um, that we'll be kind of vetting through our governance process, and we'll identify, you know, which ones we want to tackle this year. Um, but definitely, a, 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 that's a, a big, big, big focus there. Um, specifically, looking at in terms of technology, looking at um, ways to maximize our use of the cloud. Um, I think for a small organization like ours, it does not make sense for us to ingest all of HHS data and then analyze it. It's like, how do we architect a um, environment and process where we can take the data we need um, for the tool that we're driving or the an analysis that we're driving and, and then um, dispose of it or, or you know, um, but, but only take parts of it. Um, and, and text analytics is huge too. I think, um, I see it as not like one stop shop tool, but more like a menu of options, depending on your use case. Um, we're a very text heavy shop. <laughs> um, and so text analytics, not only to learn what we already know, um, again, insights from that, but also, you know, we're looking at managed care contracts, um, large, uh, bodies of text where it's really difficult to get insight um, and looking to apply some advanced capabilities there. Um, and then, you know, I mentioned data engineering, but um, like, how do we streamline the way that we ingest and process data? So um, a lot of focus around data wrangling. A lot of our analysts spend a lot of time just like parsing data so that it's able to be sent, you know, um, or that the, the person receiving it can actually manage it. So uh, focusing on modernizing there. That's helpful very much. Thank you. Thanks for sharing. Um, Jerry, I know you mentioned a few things in terms of the, uh, the zero trust and, and security. Anything else you want to kind of elaborate or call to attention here? Yeah, I'm, I'm very interested in uh, machine learning and AI capabilities. Uh, I am looking at technologies along with Renata on um, just uh, some tools that can like look at the data pools and kind of understand what the categorization of data is, as well as map where it's going. Um, because I think that's very important if you're going to protect it, understand what it is, where it resides and where it's going. And is that the place it's supposed to go? 
Um, so, so there's that, um, right now I'm actually, you know, I just, I just got sent during when we were discussing here, um, developing a new strategic plan. It's going to be like a three to five year roadmap plan, um, new vision, new mission statement. Um, we got some about six goals. I think we're, we're trying to accomplish, um, but definitely want to bring some productivity, um, want to take advantage of the current technologies that we have. We've made big investments. Uh, one of the things, um, if anybody's familiar with the Department of Homeland Security uh, um, CDM program, it is where I come from at state, I was actually the implementation of the grandfather for that uh, program, where uh, it's a compliance diagnostics and mitigation program, where um, basically we bring in a lot of the COTS tools that we have and we put a methodology around it. So I understand what my operational risk posture is. So looking to do something like that, to bring in the tools that we have today, bring that data together and show me where my risks are, where are we not being patched, where we, maybe we have uh, end of life equipment kind of things, you know, to get that one view of that, what my, my, my risk posture is uh, rather than looking at disparate tools. So definitely so a lot of integrations there, uh, making better use of the cloud, automating a lot of things, um, you know, automating the pipeline from, you know, uh, all the way through concept to production um, with doing all the proper checks um, to, to kind of speed up that timeline. Because right now we depend on people to do these checks and those people are all in different offices with different prioritizations. So mm -hmm. um, somewhere along the line, you become a bottleneck. But automation, I think, can get us there and, and provide the output to the humans that say, yep, we've done all the checking and everything's okay still. Um, so definitely look in a lot of ways to automate things um, with a big emphasis on what's the value to the user community. Um, like I talked about performance, uh, you know, stopping the boomerang effect, relying on an on-premise network, but going straight to the destination while I still get my security telemetry, um, you know, um, one of the other things I want to do is create a CMDB. What are all the things that we own and are responsible for? Um, improving identity management, of course, uh, bringing multi-factor authentication to bear, uh, as well as, you know, unique things like BYOD, um, which actually did at my last location and was very successful in, in getting us to COVID, you know, but the security right. folks, you know, are a little it's a little intimidating, uh, the thought of it, of course. We had a lot of, you know, back and forth uh, getting it done. But now it's like uh, where I come from, it's like, yeah, you're not taking this away from me. I like this <laughs> kind right, of thing right. where people start using it. Uh, so those are some of the things that I'm looking at um, and, and supporting with Renato, whatever she said. <laughs> <laughs> so not, not a shortage of things you guys are working on. That's for sure. That's, that, that's great. We're I, not I, bored people. <laughs> yeah, not a lot of free time. That's for sure. Uh, I will take a pause here. Uh, I've been asking a lot of questions, so I, uh, I want to open it up to the audience here. Are there any questions uh, specifically for Renata or Jerry or things that we haven't covered that you'd be interested in? I, I, I think they'd love to hear any thoughts or questions as well. So just please feel free to unmute yourself if you do have any questions. Jimmy is Todd. I have a, I have a question, if, if that's fair. Um, Thinking of the comments earlier about uh, the analytics you were doing on, on opioids and, and tracking the critical nature of that epidemic, um, and also thinking about CMS, where I know that you and your mission uh, is complementary to the Center for Program Integrity and so on, it, maybe you can just help give our audience an understanding of how the OIG collaborates with complements those agencies and their missions. Maybe the CPI example is a better one of, of maybe helping us understand um, where you complement each other and collaborate, where you hand off a role and responsibility to another. And if I can add sort of a second part of a question to that one, maybe in that context of what you're doing around uh, uh, fraud, waste, abuse with CPI, what are you doing to move away from a pay and chase model to one where you're more, more proactively, you know, doing pre predictive analytics to prevent the improper payments in the first place. I know I threw a lot in there, but. but uh... Yeah, no, thanks for the question. It's a great one. Um, so with, with things like opioid epidemic, um, you know, uh, healthcare fraud in general, um, it's such a big issue. And I think what, how HHS OIG complements CPI is that we have 
we look at things at a slightly different angle um, and bring a slightly different perspective. And, but I do think it is um, symbiotic, you know, it's a, it's a, it's, it's a relationship. So um, with the opioid epidemic, you know, early on we were leveraging data and analytics to identify um, anomalies, right? Where pe beneficiaries were driving 50 miles to go to a pharmacy um, or, we were seeing the prescription rate, you know, um, being so high that like someone it's, it's beyond, you know, the, the amount that any prone person could consume. And, and, um, I think, and we developed the toolkit for those things. And I think that has permeated into kind of how um, the program does, does work, does business now. Um, so I think, um, you know, of course we have a unique law enforcement, um, a uh, mission and we partner very closely with Department of Justice and um, we have very close law enforcement relationships. So I think we can we, we sort of enhance that mission um, through our unique um, authorities. Um, on the point around, so actually the second question, I just lost it. Uh, the the so pay and chase versus- Pay and part. chase, yes. Okay, it's the, absolutely. So, um, I mentioned earlier, my big passion is um, making government data more accessible, but in the, in the context of compliance, it's how can we modernize compliance so that we make compliance easier for organizations? Um, so for example, we have a very um, important database, it's called our exclusions database that has all the list of excluded entities and individuals that can do business with uh, Medicare and Medicaid. Provide that um, you know through our website, and I think it gets a 24 million hits a year, which isn't, you know, huge. How can we make that um, more um, accessible and easy to use for um, our users? Um, and then I think also, um, you know, with internal within our organization, we are, I mentioned, I mentioned our mission is to empower OIG to use data proactively. So the goal is not that we are the hub and we're the only place where analytics happens. It's really providing the tools, um, the, the capabilities for those frontline investigators and analysts to use um, proactively. So we've been, we, we certainly do a lot of um, custom analytic requests and data provision requests, but we've seen a trend for those. And we as we see a trend, we start to say, okay, well, we should we ought to build a tool for that, like hospital compliance or substance use, you know, uh, identification. Um, so we have a, a variety of tools where, um, you know, a process might take an investigator previously, you know, several days or weeks because they're waiting for things. Now they can click a button, put in an NPI, click a button and get a bunch of information out. So um, leveraging tools and um, I think in the future, sharing uh, information as appropriate <laughs> so that we can make compliance easier. Very good, thank you. Any other, other questions from the group? I think there was one that Stephanie asked about um, if HHSOIG will be attending or speaking at HIMSS, which is the, uh, the annual conference. I wasn't sure, Renato or, or Jerry, if anyone from OIG was speaking, if you're aware, this year. Not sure. I'll have to get back. Okay. Yeah. Same. Same time. Um, I think there's a question uh, from Gavin here that you mentioned the uh, desire to configure rather than customize. Uh, which uh, platforms do you anticipate leaning on to facilitate the approach? Um, and what challenges do you anticipate facing the COTS that they may not fully address, the COTS product may not address? Any, any, any insights into specific platforms and some of the challenges around the COTS pieces that you I, I try, I try to I try to stick away from, from specific vendors at times. Sure, sure. Because uh, I don't want to, um, you know... Yep talk badly about any specific one but i will say um that we were you know using a, a SaaS cloud platform um you know in modernizing a certain application um and, and, and it was becoming highly customized because um of the processes and procedures that this certain office wanted to use and things um uh, and and rightfully so it came to a pause it's like hey you know uh Look at the spend. Uh, look at the progress. Yeah, we've delivered on some things, um, which has been great. Um, but you know, there's some things out there in the world that are already doing this um, along these lines. So, you know, do we really need to reinvent the wheel? Um, so we're, we're taking that pause. 
um, and, and doing that anal analysis right now. So we've given the, the business owner, of course, I'm, I'm not being the business owner because it's, you know, I, I'm very clear about who the business owner is and I provide the IT for that business owner. Um, so, you know, they own the business and the mission. So, you know, what is it that they need? So basically we gave them, all right, the imp here's the, I'm fine with supporting you going this way, but here's the impact of doing such. Right. Um, right? And it, yeah, you know, you look at this Koch product on the surface and through these demos and yeah, the, you know, greatest things since sliced bread, exactly what I need. But then as you start getting into it, you're kind of developing your processes because the tool isn't flexible enough or mm -hmm. you're going to be waiting for versions, you know, um, to come up because why? Because the company, the vendor is a one to many, whereas us doing customization is a one-to-one -one. Mm -hmm. um so we can do it their way but of course like i said there's labor there's you know limited resources and stuff uh, we're not a for capital like a company is bringing in capital where we can hire more people and you know to do other modules and things so um kind of got to prioritize it it's not always the technology that's the hard part though and I think that is where this comes, this, this current issue that I'm talking about comes down to. It's not the technology that's the hard part. The technology is usually the easy part, whether, you know, one way or the other, whether it be cost or customization. If you don't have the right requirements and you don't have the right people and processes in place to understand what those processes that need to be done are, you know, we find like talking to people, like, what's the process? Well, they know this much of it. They don't know the whole process. So you got to talk to somebody else to get the other part of the process. You know, where does it go from here kind of thing? You know, getting those out of the customer sometimes is, is, is that's the challenging part. Is And, and as you're modernizing, you got to look at that as an opportunity as well. You know, yep. yeah, just because you're doing it this way today doesn't mean you do it that way tomorrow. It's not, don't, don't do a lift and shift. You know, yep. what, what is it you want to be able to do? Um, and let's, let's articulate those. And then that's like where the, the head start exploded. It's like, oh man, there's all these great ideas and trying to get that out of them, you know, sometimes is, is that's the challenging part, but then the technology becomes the easy part, hopefully. But yeah. I, I don't know if I answered the question, um, exactly, yeah, I, but, um, you know, I there, think we, there's I think you pros and cons to each of them. Right, right, right. No, yeah. understandably so. Um, I know we have maybe a few more minutes for questions. There's a good one for Renata. Um, can you talk about maybe specific, uh, some specific results or benefits from the, uh, like the grants portal or the geo hub that, uh, that you can speak to just for the, for the audience? Sure. Uh, I think first benefit. So we have, um, a, a little over close to 600 users of the grants analytics portal. And so it's only a tool within our own organization. Um, we've seen a, Huge, we track usage, so we track users and we track clicks, and we've seen a huge uptick, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, we were quickly able to create a COVID flag for um, for grants that were related to CARES Act or ARP funding. So um, that was a huge benefit, especially during the pandemic, you know, the crisis, to identify like, okay, here's where the risk is, here, here's where we focus. Um, so, so that's sort of our usage is a metric that we track and, and we've seen that increase. Um, one other metric is um, the time it takes for auditors to do their work. So, you know, we've, we've uh, trans translated, I think it's over 250,000 PDFs <laughs> into machine readable data. Mm -hmm. So where an auditor would have to actually comb through a PDF to find, you know, what those audit findings were in the single audit um, we've, made that all digital and we've enabled them to explore that um, by clicking on um, a few buttons and dive and then you know if they if they want to see the text of the finding we can direct them right to the report so time savings there um, and then in terms of i think this is where the ideal is in terms of like measuring impact for data analyst organizations is like what's the outcome that you're driving um, and i think this is difficult to quantify, but um, in collaboration with our audit colleagues, we've seen a number of audits initiated um, that I think wouldn't otherwise have been initiated um, because of this transparent, this access to data. So we're, um, you know, there's, there's a number of NIH audits. Um, uh, there's certainly a number of um, 
actually, you know, we're looking at, you know, the, the, um, the prices of the children at the border, looking at audit, um, you know, grants going to um, these facilities and identifying risk there. So I think the, the kind of outcome impact that we are still, it's difficult to quantify is insights are coming faster and we're able to target work that is the highest, high, the highest risk issues. Um, with the geo portal, I th it's still very new. It's um, a little less than a month, I think, that since it's been launched. So we're actively tracking, um, you know, users and um, we'll be soliciting feedback there. Thank you, that, that's great. I think one, uh, one very, something that stuck in my head, especially with the grants, when I, the way you've described it, it's part of like two different things. One is like finding the right cases, right? Like, so identification of the right cases based on all the data. And then the second is working those cases the right way. So getting all the data together in, in a way that's uh, helpful. So uh, I think those are great benefits. And I think clearly, clearly tied to the mission. So that's great. I do want to be cognizant of time. It is uh, about 1.15. So I, I don't want to keep uh, Renata and Jerry much longer in case, unless there's any more questions we have from the group, we maybe can get one more in. If anyone has any. Well, if not, I don't see anyone coming through. So I wanted to just take this time to again, thank thank you, Renata and Jerry for taking the time here. This is incredibly valuable and, and very informative for us to hear as this group and kudos to you and your teams for doing all this amazing work for HHS and OIG and, and just the, the impact you're having. So uh, thank you. And definitely, you know, hopefully uh, feel free to stop by again. And if you want, if you have anything to share or you want to pick our brains, uh, this group is all about the engagement and intersection of government and industry. So if there are ideas or topics or projects you have, we're happy to help support for sure. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Great. Wonderful. Uh, Todd, I'll turn it back to you. Yeah. Thank you, Jimmy. And Jimmy, thanks for moderating this. And again, Jerry and Renata, thank you so much for your time. Uh, I think you both said this at the very beginning, uh, appreciative of ACT IAC for the work that they're, we're doing to try to enable this sort of discourse collaboration. And Jerry brought up the word partnership repeatedly with industry. And, and I certainly appreciate that. I think we all do as well. So thanks for the time. Thanks for being open. Thanks for being transparent. Thanks for being, for doing what you're doing to uh, open up data uh, to all of those who need to have this information and to make things more efficient. Very important work. Thank you so much. Thank you for um, having us. We'll, we'll, we'll follow up quickly. Bobby Sachs and I will follow up uh, afterwards. Just We do try to keep people engaged with us beyond just simply speaking engagements. We have an informal advisory council we're trying to form with, with people like yourselves and other speakers. So we'll follow up with you as well, just to at least keep you informed of what we're doing, if not actually participating. Um, so thank you again. Uh, for everyone else, and you're welcome to stay on, we'll spend just a couple minutes here, just sort of like the business aspect of our of our meeting today. Again, Bobby Saxon could not join us today, um, our, our government co-chair. Uh, first, I just want to put on your radar, we do have speakers scheduled uh, for July and September. Uh, July is the chief technology officer for the FDA, Ram Iyer. Uh, we spoke to him the other day to prepare for that. That is on our COI calendar. Uh, certainly register for that through the ACT IAC website if you have not done so already. And in September, uh, we'll have the acting director of the National Institutes of Health, uh, NCATS, which is the National Center for Advancing Translational Sciences, speak to us. If you all know Dr. Joni uh, Ritter, so she'll be speaking with us as well. Uh, we are still actively looking for a speaker in June. Uh, if anybody else has thoughts or ideas, uh, we're certainly open to that. I'm happy to work with you as well. Uh, I, I'll mention just housekeeping wise, uh, not to plug myself too much, uh, but I did change positions. I joined uh, Customer Value Partners, CBP, last week as Chief Strategy Officer. And just mentioning that because a number of people have been trying to track me down in the last couple of weeks. So, uh, if you're looking for me, uh, Nancy, get you my new contact info or I'm on LinkedIn or, or just, just find me somehow. I want to make sure you, you can reach me if you need to. Uh, let me ask others from the team here. And I'll remind everybody, this is certainly not just myself and not just Bobby. Uh, again, Jimmy, you're our, our industry vice chair. Uh, let me ask if uh, I know that Elijah Biggs, I did not see him on uh, as our knowledge capture chair and I think I saw Casey Harris on our programs chair. Uh, Casey, are you on and available? Uh, I'm just looking uh, if you have any particular updates that you would like to share with us. 
Fun. I'm on and available. Yep. I don't have any updates in particular, though, um, but this was a really great session. So thanks, guys. And, and while you're here, and maybe Jimmy, you can best uh, address this one, thinking of the project we have for the VA. Uh, Jimmy, do you want to give just a, a quick update on that, please? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, myself and, and Kel, uh, Kelly, who is co-leading it, who I think might have had to drop, are co-leading two specific projects with the VA. Um, so part of, as we know, part of the, uh, one of the aspects of this uh, community of interest is centered around uh, projects that the government agencies come to us with and, and provide, we can work uh, with the team here and others that are interested to provide solutions and a deliverable, such as a white paper or things like that. So there's two concurrent projects that are ongoing right now with the VA. One is uh, focused around the use of synthetic data and what that looks like. And Kelly is leading that one and supporting that one. And then uh, I'm helping to support a team who's uh, doing a great job with author authoritative data systems and working with the VA um, CDO, yeah. so Shemendra, who's the uh, chief tech data and technology officer within the VA as well to help them uh, come up with some ideas, best practices around those two topics related to data. And so it's very exciting and another way for us to help uh, contribute back to, to the government and to our um, kind of federal partners. So those are two, they're ongoing. We hope in the next couple of months, we'll finishing up the projects. And I think we'll somewhere in the early fall have one of the months where we'll come, we'll have the VA come and the project teams um, discuss their outputs and findings and deliverables as well. So more to come on that one. Thanks, Jamie. And it's an exciting project because the, the leadership of the VA are so actively engaged as well. And, and it's just a good segue to sort of remind everybody here that I, the, the, our community of interest, we exist not just to have these monthly uh, sessions and discussions, which are, are certainly very helpful and high profile, but a, a core part of our mission is to do exactly what Jimmy is talking about doing here with the VA. Uh, we're actively looking to engage with people in the government to really work with them on a, on a challenge, on a problem, on a need, a, a, you know, a project that we can engage with them over the course of a few months to half a year and really open up a discourse with them. And it gives government an opportunity to hear from industry about innovations, uh, thoughts on solutions, technologies, uh, thoughts on how you government official might wanna look at this issue differently and so on. It, it's a very effective mechanism, obviously for industry to engage with government, but really the values to the government, giving them exposure and access to some ideas from industry without getting into any sort of a procurement issue. It's really talking about uh, uh, bigger issues around data and strategy, maybe looking at a particular issue like you know how to, how to use synthetic de data. So uh, we're looking for opportunities like that. We're looking for projects such as this. So if anybody has thoughts or ideas on someone that we could approach who's currently in one of the federal health agencies. And again, we're not just HHS, we're also the VA. Uh, we, we tend to talk more about HHS, but the VA as well and the Defense Health Agency too. Uh, we're open to suggestions. So uh, please give me a ring uh, or Bobby Saxon or Jimmy, any of us in the team, and we'd be happy to pursue that with you. Otherwise, I don't have anything else. Uh, Nancy Delanoche with ACT IAC, do you have anything else for the team here today? No, I don't, but thank you for joining. I posted the links for the two upcoming meetings on the July meeting in September. You can register now. So um, yeah, we look forward to having you join us again. Thank you. Oh, one, one, one call out, if you, if you may, um, if we have a LinkedIn page for our specific health community interest, so that's a great way for us to, uh, for you to keep, keep pace of, of the announcements and events as well. So if you haven't done so, please go out there and join that group. And that, that's a great way for us to build momentum, but also start to share and have a community where we're talking and discussing ideas and, and collaborating as well. So I highly, highly encourage that. Yeah, you're right. My mind, I was going to mention that is our primary means of communicating beyond email and the act I website. Totally. Okay, uh, any other questions before we hang up? Do people say hang up?